came to Lincoln Center by the most, well, by the back door in many ways. It was a very odd uh, situation. Uh, I was the artistic director of Playwrights Horizons, which is a small off-Broadway theater only devoted to new American writers, and I was very happy there. I was friends with Bernie Gersten and Gregory Mosher, my predecessor, and one day Bernie called me up and said, Gregory is leaving, which I was totally surprised by. I'd only been at Lincoln Center Theater for five and a half years. Bernie called up and said, uh, I just want you to know I'm calling everyone in the theater community and, and uh, curious to know what you think of this list of possible candidates. I, I think this was in March of 1991, I think. And Gregory was leaving in the beginning of the following year, at the end of 1991, and uh, they needed to work quickly. Bernie and the board, being the iconoclasts that they are, did not want to go through this dreary kind of search committee and endless interviews because, you know, the field is the field. It's not so unknown. So Bernie read me on the phone this list of people, most of them directors, which I am not. Uh, and, you know, what do you think of this one? And what do you think of that one? And, you know, I said, well, he would be wonderful or she would be great or he would do this well, but I don't know about that, so forth. And then finally, oddly, at the end of this list, he said, and what do you what do you think about Andre Bishop? And I had no idea that uh, it never occurred to me during that conversation that I would be up for the job, nor did I ever think I would want it. Uh, and I thought for about 10 seconds, which seemed like 10 minutes, and I said, well, he might be an interesting choice, I, something like that. And I said, he and Bernie said, well, do you think he would be interested? And I think, said, well, he might be interested. He would certainly be an offbeat choice. And then very quickly after that, I don't seem to think I even had an interview, as I recall. I got the job. Um, it was really like going to the bakery to buy a loaf of bread. I mean, it was so odd. Now, I <coughs> had you know, I was a known quantity to people in New York because I'd been director of Playwrights Horizons for a number of years and I was kind of going through a my honeymoon period with the New York theater uh, then. And so that's how I got the job. Because there was no programming, I we recreated the production we had done at Playwrights Horizons of The Substance of Fire by John Robin Bates, which had a quite a long life at Playwrights, but not long enough. That was a great success for us. Then, I, I don't remember in order, The Most Happy Fella came about because The Good Speed had done it, and Jerry Gutierrez, who had directed it, was a very close friend of mine and had directed quite a bit at Playwrights Horizons. And then, of course, we did The Sisters Rosenzweig. I mean, that play and my friendship with Wendy Wasserstein who came with me from Playwrights Horizons, that play kind of saved my neck here, really, because it was such a huge success. Her Royal Highness, the Grand Duchess Anastasia Rosenzweig, Romanov. Das Vidanya. Many, that's my good evening gown. Duh. I have come to celebrate the name day of my sister. Sarah Gould. Romanov. And don't forget about your other sister, the eminent Petrograd physician, Dr. Gorgeous Noodles Romanov. <laughs> it made some of the things that were not such huge successes sort of vanish into the mists of memory. I very much believe that producing, which is basically what I do with everyone else here at Lincoln Center Theater, is nothing more than the intelligent exercise of one's own taste. And I believe in that, and I always have. I believe very strongly in the instincts I have about a certain piece of writing or a certain work or a certain director. I don't analyze that very much. I've been able, after all these years, to shut out most other considerations that perhaps I should think about, like, will anyone like this play? Will anyone come to this play? Is this play well written or not? I don't think about any of that. 
I only think, and I've been lucky enough to work in two theaters where that's been okay, I only think about, do I, Andre, have a response in my heart or in my mind or in both to this whatever it is? It's a very personal approach for me. Obviously, here at Lincoln Center, I have to consider the shape of our two theaters, and that is part of my philosophy. We have two thrust theaters, and the Beaumont being very big, and, and the Beaumont not being suitable for a lot of plays, naturalistic family dramas, the kind Frankly, the Beaumont isn't suitable for most of what's been written in the American theater for the past 50 or 60 years. It's suitable for presentational plays, for large-scale epic plays, oddly for musicals. So there's a limit as to what the Beaumont can do because some things just will not come off well there. Farce, you know, you can't, farce you need to all look in one direction and the Beaumont, someone's looking here or there. So it's a challenge to program the Beaumont Theatre, but again, I feel that's been the most successful thing I've done, is the constant and I hope imaginative use of the Beaumont. Perfect place for the Beaumont. There have been a number of them, I think, because the thought that goes into what to do in the Beaumont and who to direct in the Beaumont and design in the Beaumont the thought that goes into it is, is massive. Um, I think the first show we did in the Beaumont that I just loved, and I picked it purpose, on purpose to show off the Beaumont, was this old play by Robert E. Sherwood called Abe Lincoln in Illinois, which had, I don't know how many actors, it was huge and nationalistic and American and had a fantastic central performance by Sam Waterston and a train and everything, but it, it showed off the possibilities of a, a play with a fearless director and designer who was not afraid of using all of the Beaumont. I mean, I think in the past there's been a, attempts to scale the Beaumont down somehow to, to bring it down, and you can't really do that, I don't think. Abe Lincoln was the first one. Certainly, Julie Tamor's Juan Darien was one. Carousel, because so much of Carousel was circular. The design, the moon, and the, the mounds, and all that. Carousel, and the carousel itself. Henry IV, any Shakespeare, is going to be perfect for the Beaumont. We've done three, Henry IV and Twelfth Night and Cymbeline. The Coast of Utopia. Now, interestingly, South Pacific. There is nothing like a day, nothing in the world. There is nothing you can name that is anything like a day. If you do these revivals of these old musicals, you don't want to change them, you want to honor them, but you've got to look at them from a slightly different perspective. And I don't mean just scenery. What's interesting about South Pacific and Carousel is that they were these honored proscenium shows that were forced to be turned upside down in a way because of the thrust stage, which is both lofty and extremely intimate. And what's interesting about South Pacific in particular is that though there are scenes of huge numbers of people, the bulk of South Pacific is very small. The bulk of it is two to three people on stage alone. And the Beaumont, you know, the last row is not that far away. So I think those have been the ones that have worked the best. But Spalding Gray always worked well in the Beaumont. And Barbara Cook, one person shows directed to the audience all the way around, work really well. I think the challenges for designers and directors are intense. I mean, to know, and it's all linked, where the strong, the sweet spots, as they call them, of the stage are and it isn't necessarily up-center in these thrust theaters. I mean, it is. Obviously, everything up-center is better because if you're up-center, you can be seen by everyone all the way around, but you can't stage the entire play up-center. So you have to have a director who understands the sides and is willing to direct for the sides as well as for the front. And some directors, quite frankly, aren't. So that their work seems 
wonderful and nicely staged if you're sitting in the best seats, but if you're sitting on the sides, it's not so good. The action of a thrust theater, you need to keep much more motion than you would in a proscenium. Actors must unconsciously, seemingly unconsciously, and naturally change their positions much more than they would in a proscenium house. And that's a big test for any director, as well as not to be afraid of turning your back to the audiences and, and not being afraid of, in the constant shifting of patterns, of leaving someone out because you want to include someone in.